I don't understand where ass candy is coming from. The mouth comes... Oh, the ass to mouth, I understand. It's fine. Don't... <clears throat> <clears throat> and now, Some Nobodies presents PowerPoint Showdown, where each presenter arrives unprepared and just has to do their best. Without further ado, this week's keynote speaker. Hello, and thank you for joining us for our conference. Tonight, you will hear four professionals discuss our topic, the danger of memories. With me, as always, our sweatshirt with words, cat, here, cat hair guru, Mick Manhattan, and of course, I am your keynote speaker, Mitch Philadelphia. I will be leading this conference. For those of you joining us for the first time, each speaker will be given 10 minutes to present our topic of the week. After each presentation, there will be a short Q&A from the panel. And of course, we invite any members of the audience to ask questions as well. After the fourth presentation, the panelists will vote on which speaker will be awarded the $50,000 scholarship to some nobody's university and the nostalgia prize. Uh, sweatshirt with words. Uh, do you have the nostalgia prize for this week? Yeah, it actually just came in a couple minutes ago. Let me open this thing up real fast. Oh, weird. Okay, cool. Uh, apparently, our nostalgic prize of the week is a uh, a Bart Simpson happy birthday tin from 1990. and says, happy birthday, man. Uh, well, that's interesting. 1990, that's like when the Simpsons hmm. kind of came out, I guess. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Pete, from uh, our Patreon for sending that in. Thank you, Pete. Uh, now, without further ado, I'm going to deliver our first presentation. Uh, if you could open our pre my presentation, please. My presentation today is on memory. Is it dangerous? Only you can tell. But you can only tell if you can remember. But if you remember, it might be dangerous. We'll find out more about this um as this presentation keeps going um i couldn't remember the word i was trying to think of because it's dangerous to remember uh next slide please now it's not easy to forget but it is easy to lie to yourself about <laughs> things from your past um, now I forgot, uh, at one point in time, how I really feel about the movie, uh, A Clockwork Orange. Um, but I lied to myself. I said, this movie is real cool. I love it. It looks great. It's so much fun to watch. And Alex's outfit is a real cool um, but that was a lie. And when I went against my memory and watched it again, I realized that that memory was dangerous. It did damage to myself and others. Uh, next slide, please. <sighs> now, this slide is there's a lot going on here. Um, this is the Atkinson Shrifton model. Um, I'm sure you're all very well aware of the Atkinson Shrifton model. Um, it has to do with sensory memory, uh, short term memory. We're encoding into long term memory. We're able to retrieve our long term memories into short term memories. Um, by using sensory registers, uh, visual, auditory, touch, taste, smell, um, our long-term memory and our permanent memory, surprisingly two different things. Um, you would think that your long-term memory and your, your uh, permanent memory storage is the same thing, but it's not. Um, 
my short term memory is the dangerous part of my memory. Um, so I tend to not tap into that. I can tell you what happened in 1983 when I was four years old, but I can't tell you what my last slide was about. Um, I have completely wiped it from my memory. Um, now, the model describes memory as an owl of information with inputs, processes, outputs. Um, our short-term memory information is rehearsed and can be stored through permanently. Look, you all can read. Um, I'm not going to bore everyone with this. This is trivial. This is basic knowledge. Everyone knows this. You were taught this in third grade. Um, 1987, I think I was in third grade. And uh, and I still remember all of that stuff because it was so long ago. So the the short term stuff that I have blocked out of my memory now uh, will eventually be long term. Um, so hopefully by the time I remember it in 10 years, it won't be quite so dangerous. Next slide, please. Now back to a clockwork orange. Um, I forget what a clockwork orange was about. And I think that that is on purpose. Um, I took my short term memory and I erased it. Um, Someone did, uh, I don't remember because it was less than 10 years ago, but someone did sit me down uh, and make me watch this movie again. Um, they pried my eyes open with uh, with some sort of torture device and a doctor was sitting right next to me, uh, continuously dropping eye drops of, of liquid into my eyes so that they didn't dry out. Um, I don't remember why that was, though. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, as you can see from this picture, um, Malcolm McDowell at one point was uh, very sexy. But uh, now he's an old man. And although he is still kind of sexy, he's old man sexy which is different he doesn't have those pecs he doesn't have those abs anymore um but i'll bet his dick still looks the same next slide please now memories can be fuzzy uh, sometimes you do things and you don't remember why that was um sometimes you pose next to um a gears of war man uh, holding his Gears of War gun, uh, wearing a Skyrim hat and a portal shirt. And why did that happen? I don't know. That was eight years ago, it seems like. Um, so I don't remember why, why, why that happened. Um, I do remember after playing Gears of War, I did throw my phone at my computer monitor because it was so terrible. Um, but I blocked the memory of why out of my memory. As you can tell, my memory works very well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. In this picture, we're going to use... Now, there is a shorter, shorter term memory um, than your regular short-term memory. So we're going to use that right now. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to memorize these two pictures. We're going to, at the end of the demonstration, we're going to recall, without looking at these pictures again, what was different um, without writing anything down and without going back. Uh, if you don't remember, uh, you will be kicked out of the auditorium. No writing anything down. Uh, I took a picture. It's okay. Slide, please. Quickly, quickly, quickly. This is not going quickly. 
Next, there we go. Oh. Okay. Now, my worst memory of high school. Um, two of these are a lie, and one of them is a truth. I do remember which one is which uh, because it was more than 10 years ago. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I don't know why I put two lies up here. Um, I've never danced once in my entire life. So I was never caught dancing. Um, the one time with the soda machine, we'll get to that. Um, I never had a t crush on a teacher. That would be weird. Teachers are old. Um, so I don't know why I put these. I don't know why I put these up on the slide, but the one time with the soda machine um, was my worst memory in high school. I put in my 75 cents to get my Fruitopia and the Fruitopia did not come out. It was, it was grape mango Fruitopia. And as everyone knows, that's the Fruitopia that you want. Um, so when I put in my 75 cents, it was my last 75 cents and uh, it didn't come out. So like the big strong man that I am, I decided that I was going to shake the vending machine to get my Fruitopia. Now, when I shook the soda machine, um, it did fall on top of me. And then the Fruitopia violently ejected out of the soda machine directly into my testicles now that experience gave me a fetish that lasted through the rest of my days um to this day i can only shoot if i'm being crushed and and having uh testicle trauma uh so you wanted to hear that story and now you can't not know that story so i'm going to ask for my last slide please now in conclusion from now on i think you should make it a christmas day with your family tradition to watch a clockwork orange um you want to watch those incredibly long uh scenes of sexual violence you're going to want to watch uh, people get tortured. You're going to want to watch um, just some some terrible stuff go on. Um, on the day that Jesus was born, uh, which everyone knows is the most traumatic uh, event that happened in human history. So your memories, in conclusion, your memories are dangerous. Um you you really the things that you remember are things that you don't want to remember and the things that you don't remember such as words or what happened you know 33 seconds ago hmm? is my presentation over i don't remember um do we have any questions from the panel or the audience Uh, yeah. Uh, Mick Manhattan, you have a question. Yes, I do have a question about your Fruitopia experience. Yes. Um, when the, uh, you said that, you know, you being a man in high school and shaking it, mm -hmm. um, would you say that even though you've gained a sexual fetish from it, that it was a good idea or a bad idea? Is this a memory you want to hold on to or forget? Um, well, I have no control over what memories I hold on to and which ones I don't. Um, that has some somewhat to do with being crushed by the Fruitopia machine. Uh, my brain holds on to some memories and, and not some. Um, I would love to forget the actual incident without losing the fetish because I do enjoy the crushing and the uh groin trauma so if i could forget the the origin of it 
but not forget it itself, that would be ideal. But I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. Okay. Are, are there any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, sweatshirt. Uh, thank, first and foremost, thank you very much for being here. We definitely appreciate all of your time, um, especially now that you've invented that weird uh, soda machine hugger thing like uh, Temple Grandin. Um, but if we can go back to that one slide, uh, please. I think it's slide number four. Yeah, this slide right here. Now, this looks like the stage play of A Clockwork Orange instead of the movie, if I'm correct. Um, and if so, would you mind telling us what your favorite song from the stage play is? Um, my favorite song from the stage play would probably be, I can't quite remember the name of it, uh, but it goes something like, my eyes, my eyes, I cannot close my eyes. Uh, Why won't you let me close my eyes? <laughs> I was going to say Ludovico Ludovico is my favorite piece as well. Oh, well, Dylan, listen, Dylan listens to everything in Italian, but my eyes is my favorite song as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's, it's generally accepted as, as the best song from yeah. the soundtrack. Yes. Um, yes uh, Cat hair guru. Um, thank you for your presentation. Scattered though it was. Um, now you, you listed, the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is the number one traumatic event in history. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the next top two most traumatic events in human history for us. Well, the second most uh, traumatic experience was when uh, it was in uh, 1492. Um, it was when Columbus discovered that the Earth was not indeed <laughs> flat, and it was a cylinder um a lot of people still don't accept the the cylinder earth a lot of wars have been fought about it um so i would call that the second most uh pretty much the things the traumatic things that happen have mostly to do with the wars that they started of course the most wars are started um in the name of jesus um the second most is our cylinder earth uh, people can't seem to accept that. And then um, the third most traumatic incident was actually the release of the movie, a clockwork orange. Um, it has caused uh, friendships to dissolve. It has caused me personally uh, much great trauma um, specifically from one particular person who won't let it go that at one point I liked that movie um, as if he never liked that movie either uh, where, but that's a personal thing for me. Um, but also a great number of wars was started over whether a clockwork orange was good or not. Thank you. Long winded, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do around here. Um, so just like Philadelphia without, f absolutely without further ado, um, we're going to welcome our second panelist. Uh, Mick Manhattan is ready to do his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, why my memories shot? This is all about how I've lost my memory over time and the causes that have brought me to it. Now, would you take me to the next slide, please? And here we go. Graphs. Graphs are good. Graphs tell you exactly what you're thinking at all times. Because I have no memory, I need them. The basics here are lots and lots of drugs. Grade A primo drugs. And my, it even dates back to when I was in the womb and my mother smoked the crack. I Yes, I was a crack baby. And my father, the alcoholic, introduced me to wonderful taste of Schlitz at a very early age of five. So these really did, these were like the, the precipice of why my memory has disappeared. And then, of course, there was more drugs in middle school and then, uh, you know, 
dairy, of course, takes its toll. It helped me grow, made my body good. Then I got off the drugs for a little while, and then spring break 1988, and we won't talk about that, but let's just say it was uh, Jeff Dwoskin and I went on a really uh, hardcore bender. Now, if you don't know who Jeff Dwoskin is, we understand that. So moving on, the venereal disease that I gained in 1999 after going to see Rent on Broadway was really what took it to the next level. The syphilis, which has been untreated the entire time, and I still have, and I maintain, is really what brought everything around. So now I don't remember anything, and it feels good. Please, next slide. What happens when you take too much LSD? Well, I hate to be bear bad news, but great things happen when you take too much LSD. Uh, have you ever seen Firestarter? True story. It's an absolute gem. It's way better than a clockwork orange. Little Drew Barrymore burning up the government. It is fantastic. And it is exactly what you dream of when you are under the effects of LSD. So I would like to say you should always aim for more LSD than you've been told to take. Maybe about two or three doses more at a time. It will really help you go along the road the way and you'll be eating mustard next to an outlet just like this graph shows next slide please i mean the penis shall we affect it and i know this says memory but let's face facts the penis is where you get most of your memories from um this is pretty self-explanatory i could go over this all day long uh dairy for lack of a better term we know what that has to do with the penis you get milked, am I right? But if you don't remember it, it's called, what is it? Anybody? Anybody? The Penis Bill milk. Cosby disease. Oh. The Bill Cosby disease. <laughs> so, um, those effects <laughs> have <laughs> those, uh, that condition has a horrible effect on the memory. Um, so please, Cover your drinks, everybody. Next slide, please. Allow me to pitch this remake of Pretty Woman, except she's an earthworm. All right. Let's, uh, so Pretty Woman. We all know it. It's a national treasure of a film. Julia Roberts at an early age just killing it. And, of course, American Gigolo, Richard Gere stepping in as the older man who falls in love with her her prostitute self. Now let's remake this the way it should have been remade in the first place with an earthworm, but not just any earthworm, earthworm Jim. We need to bring that beautiful cartoon game, video game loving earthworm that saves the day back into the fold. But this time he's down and out in Beverly Hills and he is out there turning tricks trying to get his ray gun back when who stops by but a wealthy billionaire played by mr richard gear still the same man coming back we need him we need him today all right so he comes back and he grabs this earthworm up and he takes it he takes it back to his hotel room and you know the rest let's go from there but let's just say earthworm jim looks really good in the red dress it's amazing but instead of Jason Alexander this time, we are going to recast with Pete Davidson. So, I mean, I think it works. It's a hit. Who's with me? Next slide, please. Where was I? Obviously, buckets. One filled with water, one filled with marbles. Two full buckets, one with water and one with marbles. Should have read that before I said it. But... <laughs> What does this mean when it comes to memory? One with water. What do you do with water? You bathe in it. You drink it. It rejuvenates you. One with marbles. What do marbles represent? The brain. Need I say more? Next slide, please. This, I, this is, in fact, exactly how Spring Bank in 88 went on the LSD. That's Jeff right behind me. I had a terrible bout of diarrhea that weekend brought on by, um, you know, the LSD and many other things, the crack cocaine. 
Uh, yeah, and let's just say Jeff got pink guy that week. It was it was tough. To, it was a tough day for everyone. But did it help my memory of the situation? Yes, because he will not stop telling me about it. He just keeps reminding me. So, yes, spring break did help my memory in many ways. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I have no idea what I'm saying. Because my memory has been turned to a void of just filled with drugs, syphilis, and shitting on friends. And uh, it's been a sad state. Nancy Reagan once gave me an award for worst memory of all time due to drugs. She gave me, that award was the You Cannot Say No, Can You? Award. So, like I said, in conclusion, memory. I will be taking any questions that you may have. Oh, Mr. Kobe. <laughs> uh, What's up, sir? Yeah, I am going to need you to say more <laughs> about how uh, marbles represent uh, the brain. I'm oh. sorry, but uh, okay. we're no, here no. to we're here to learn. Um, and I, that it's the one thing in your presentation that I did not understand. Well, when you have water, the body's made up of seventy percent water, correct? Mm -hmm. correct? And obviously, yeah. marbles are a representation of brain cells, correct? <laughs> you clearly have many, 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 many marbles. So the bucket would have to be bigger than what the water is being held in. And that clearly means that your brains could drown, but probably not all of them. And in conclusion, mm. the marbles belong in the bucket on the right. Yeah, that does make sense. Okay, yeah, that makes much more sense now. Thank you. You're quite welcome, sir. Sweatshirt, how am I? What's the uh, question, sir? First, thank you for being here. Uh, I know it's been a tough struggle since 88, um, and you're walking again, and that's good to see. Now, if we could actually bring up that that one slide of your spring break of 88, I did have a question about the coloring of this. Uh, now, does the coloring, is this force or particulates? That is just a lot of blood. Oh, God. <laughs> and the blue represents the darker fecal matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a rough weekend. There was a lot of chili. We went to uh, <laughs> went to south of the border on our way down. Yeah. It was it was really bad. Now the lighter particles are just more of the mist mm. that came out. Uh, I cannot say enough that he suffered a great deal that day. Yeah, and um, yeah, he just he got hit with it for sure, and uh, I feel bad still to this day. Now, from what I've heard, he had his mouth open the entire time. Is that true? He wouldn't close it. I didn't understand why. I kept trying to ask him, and he just kept saying, I have a podcast, and it just it was, you know, it got yeah. in there. And, that, and, and, even, it, and from, from what I've seen on TikTok, you actually turned around and told him, hey, stop eating my bloody feces, and he got behind you again. Uh, that's some talent. Well, you know, see, the problem was I wanted a stool sample. But how do you get a stool sample out of a guy who won't leave it alone? You know? So <laughs> it was just, a, it was a tough time all around. It was a tough time all around. Uh, yes, Cat Hair Guru. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, and the vulnerability on display is quite something. Um, I was curious about the slide regarding the movie reboot. Um, this this is the one. I was having an issue finding the relevance of this to the rest of your presentation, if you wouldn't mind going into why this was included. Oh, well, of course. I'm sorry. I, you know, the thing is, my mother was a prostitute. <laughs> and my father was a billionaire. But he never knew. It ended really poorly for him. So when this movie came out, it was like almost like the dream I wanted to happen. He, he didn't know he was a billionaire? No, he didn't know I existed. Oh, okay. Oh. So, I, you know, I always hoped they would have gotten together in the end. But the problem was my mother liked to dress up as an earthworm when she would go out hooking. But they didn't want to take that the first time, I guess. Mm. But mm. I'm going to remake it in the right way. Okay. No, thank you. 
and I remember that. <laughs> yes, thank you. That is for sure. I do have oh. one. More, I do have one more question before we move on with our panel tonight. Um, now there was some contention over whether this was Dick Milk or uh, Bill Cosby. Uh, something. Uh, if we could bring that slide back up, please, because a I was confused about what the slide was. Not this one. It was the one with I think a penis. Come on, producers. <laughs> this one. Now yes. there was a point that uh you said, what does that get you? And I believe one of our panelists said dick milk, and they were incorrect. <laughs> and you said that it was Bill Cosby. Um, how does Bill Cosby affect dick milk? Well, milk does a body good, and we all know <laughs> we all know that Bill Cosby always carried a drink around with him. Um, and well, yeah. he did like to erase memories the best he could. Uh, that actually makes more sense than I thought about it. And, and you can mix jello powder into the milk and make chocolate milk, and it's great. Okay. Chocolate jello? Okay. Well, I mean, it's easier to hide the Spanish fly. No, that's fair. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mister Mick Manhattan. Thank, thank you, for you. thank you, Mick. Uh, and now uh, the ado <laughs> will no further be uh, there. Um, we're going to welcome our next panelist, uh, Sweatshirt with the words. Well, hello there. I'm glad it finally came to me. I thought I had already gone, and my presentation was done. And I, in fact, am incorrect. Now, what I'm going to be talking to you about, I'm pretty sure I've already talked to you about this, but what I'm going to be saying is, are you a brain in a jar with false memories? And does it matter? When it comes down to it, what is memory except just something? Something inside of your skull. And your skull is just a brain of something. And there's just some things inside of that something. And it could just be a jar full of marbles and maybe some water that could have drowned it or it could just be i don't know just nothing in there but let's get into it though next slide please now how do you know your memories are reliable i put together a quick little diagram of a couple different ways things could have gone and how you remember it now if he looks over to his right you can see that the conduit is completely put together electricity is going to flow now when he looks at the other side there's a little bit of a crinkle in this wire. And as your dad tells you, you put a kink in the hose, shit's going to go bad. So he put together a little bit of a formula in his head on how he can remember which one works, which hose has the kink in it. Now, when it comes down to the reliability of your own memories, it's really just whatever you say, because you're the one who's in charge of that. If I say something, it's probably because I remembered it. Next slide, please. How do you know you aren't a brain in a jar? Now, we've already discussed what a brain in a jar is, which is just, just a culmination of crap inside of something. Now, you probably are not a brain in a jar, but you might be. Now, have you noticed anything weird recently that would make you think, I might be a brain in a jar? Have you seen like a floating saucer that looks kind of like the underbelly of a fish while going over you in a fan boat? It's probably nothing to worry about, though. Uh, it could just be anything. It could be uh, the, the amount of drugs that Mike McManhattan has done, whether it's uh, uh, a lot of drugs, uh, more drugs, or dairy. That can make you see a lot of things. Um, you probably are not a brain in a jar. But we'll get to that in a second. Next slide, please. Life as a brain in a jar. I have realized that if I would look at my life as though I were a brain in a jar, I would need to start acting as such. I can't just assume I'm not a brain in the jar and then have people look at me like, that is not a guy who's a brain in a jar. Now, as I just pretend and uh, elaborate on my life as a brain in a jar, I've realized a couple things. I have no job. Nobody hires jars full of just mucus-filled blood. Uh, I also have no bills. I can't do anything. I can't pay for anything. I can't ask for anything. Zero obligations. Nobody will help me now that I'm a brain in a jar. Nobody wants to help me move. I can't find a friend with a truck. Uh, I also can't karaoke. As a brain in a jar, I don't have a mouth, nor do I have the understanding of how good a Clockwork Orange the musical is, and I just can't sing it to my friends, no matter how much they don't like me. The thing is, though, there is a small possibility I have psychic abilities. Uh, I've had this jar move. I know that because I have moved around my space. So I would assume that I have some sort of abilities that are outside of the realm of the brain in the jar. Uh, next slide, please. Why would anyone put a brain in a jar? 
that's what I'm wondering. I keep seeing my body somewhere. I'm like, well, who took my brain out? Uh, it is a neat idea, though. I came up with this. Uh, I thought that I'd text Dylan this idea for one of our other shows about putting my brain in a jar, but it turns out it was real life. Uh, it actually keeps someone alive after a horrible accident. We'll get into what my accident is later. Uh, now, you signed your body over to science, and it turns out uh, your comatose body was donated to an immoral science uh, scientist performing experiments under the table. This happens so much more than you think it does. Now, it's easy for these millennials to say, ah, oh, I give up. I just don't want to do anything. Please put my brain in a jar. But guess what? There's some creepy ass scientists out there that's going to start doing some immoral things, performing experiments under the table. And as we've all known, watching CSI and experiments that go under the table are the bad ones. Now, you could have something like a vibrator hooked up to an accelerator that's just smashing you down like a pounded out fish. Or you could be a brain in the jar. Next slide, please. Now, do you think you could handle the truth if you actually were a brain in the jar? We've tried to ask people this question, and with all the gurgling that comes out of these jars, I can't tell what people are saying. I'm asking them, do you think you could handle it? And it's just blah, 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 blah. Now, I haven't taken the time to understand what these brains and jars are actually saying, and I honestly don't care. They should have the psychic abilities to tell me what they're thinking. Now, when it comes down to it, they are just brains in jars, so I leave them in my fridge. Um, I don't think they can handle it. Uh, the only thing I actually cannot handle is what to do with all these bodies. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, what can we learn? When you have when you have the proper amount of transmissions, transmittance, when there's the right amount of the percentage of transmittance, <laughs> and then you cross that with the wavelength, never mind. Uh, that's how you uh, gauge wavelengths and how many never minds there are. You can actually get things like the Way and Bunner scale. Now, you can have uh, uh, C O O H C H N H. You can have all this shit. But guess what? If you are just a brain in a jar, this doesn't mean anything to you. No matter how many brains in jars I've shown this slide to, they have not learned anything. Now, granted, I've measured these wavelengths are going up and these go things are going down. As a matter of fact, I recently just bought an oscillometer, 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 and that gauges wavelengths. I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at, though, honestly. Next slide, please. Now, inclusion, you're probably fine. It's an easy thing to wake up in the morning and say, what, 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 what? Am I a brain in a jar? You're probably fine. Now, you could be a, a, a cognitive a beetle for all you know. You have no idea. Uh, you, but the things that you really going to pay attention to are the attention you're paying to yourself. There's also the executive function that you probably should pay attention to. Now, memory, we don't really need to worry about that one because that one's doing just fine. It's going to attach itself to some kind of super group. Things are great. Now, processing speed, that's going to be the tub one. That's the one that's going to hang out for quite a long time. All in all, you're probably fine. Don't worry about it. It does not matter how many jars you have, how many brains are in those jars, what to do with all these dead bodies. You just got to remember why you're doing this to begin with, which I don't. But that will be the conclusion of my <laughs> presentation. I will take every single question anyone has, please, on memory and whether or not I've already given this presentation tonight. Yes, Cat Hair Guru. Um, yes, if you could just... Let me know if you feel this or this. Whoa. <clears throat> or you're noticing any sort of shift in your perception now. Well, no, that last one didn't do anything. Excellent. Okay, no further questions. Oh. I'm going to go play with that jar in a second. Mr. McManhattan. Yes, uh, if you could bring up the, um, the fish diagram again. Oh, with the vibrator. Yep. Yes, yes. Um, so... From what I understand, and I, I felt like I've seen this um, experiment before. Mm -hmm. Now, if I remind me if I'm correct, the vibrator is helping with the acceleration and helping the fish to meet the speed force. Is that what this is? Yes, that's how this one turned into. The original one, which was the gerbil, it was kind of the reverse, where we were using a speed force to power the vibrators. And that was causing a lot of brains to fall out of bodies. That's why I had to put some of them in a jar. So then we kind of dialed it back a little bit and said, hey, what are we doing wrong? Maybe instead of the speed force forcing the vibrators on people, we should have the vibrators forced into the speed force. 
So yeah, this is uh, the second of six different iterations of this machine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, Mitch, Philadelphia. Now, this might be a uh, false memory, but I remember you talking about uh, traveling to outer space mm -hmm. to fight uh, an Eldritch Horror. Um, I was just wondering, because you sort of skipped past that, that there was, uh, I, I assume... I assume there was a big battle because you did say that you were victorious. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering how you defeated a god and what you did in outer space to uh, keep yourself alive. Yeah, thank you for the question. I um, I didn't really want to go into this because the thing of it is I remember too much of this incident, which I thought would not be very relevant to a, a presentation on memory loss or the dangers of it. But yeah, there was a time that I had to go up into outer space and I had to talk to uh, this, this space boss. I had to learn myself this alien language similar to 13th Warrior. And when it came down to it, after all the tests that they gave me, I failed them incessantly. And after years and years of being trapped on their spaceship, now granted, the gravitational force was so different that it was only mere days on Earth, but it was thousands of years to me. What it came down to was a simple game of table football. Uh, I blew their minds with it. They didn't understand the idea of a triangle. Um, and once I formed this uh, piece of paper that had in my pocket into a football and taught them about how to do this procedure, um, it just seemed like a lot of things were going my way since then. Uh, they elected me to certain offices, which I could not understand because of the dialect itself. And um, from the inside out, I end up planting tiny bombs and uh, exploding my way back into Earth's orbit. Okay. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. And thanks for reading that book, by the way. Absolutely. Any more questions on Brain in a Jar? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to your votes later. All right. Um, now, without further ado, please welcome our final speaker for the night, uh, Cat Hair Guru. Well, thank you. Now, uh, I will be speaking on memory. And I am here with my associate who is undergoing their training to gain. Oh, yes. They're training in feline psychotherapy. Now, this is Alfredo Broomfield. Um, <clears throat> top of his feet. Oh, he has very important balls to lick. All right. Uh, <laughs> he has other things to be doing today. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I will be solo speaking, it seems, on memory. The silent killer. It kills everybody because eventually you die two deaths. You die your physical death and you die your final death when nobody remembers who you are. And ultimately, only one of those is guaranteed because people forget stuff more often than they die. <laughs> Let's go on to the next slide, please. I had pulled from a lot of sources for this uh, presentation. And what that means is I stole content from other sources without um, citing them. And I'm passing these off as my original work. Um, now, these are some websites um, now, this is self-plagiarization because I, of course, registered and owned and wrote every piece of content on all four of these websites. And those are wepd.com, kickpunch.com slash Joe Rogan, keyboard.com, and verywellhead.com. <clears throat> I would not necessarily encourage anyone to go visit these websites unless, of course, you are using a public computer in such uh, an environment as a library where there may be children behind you and they can look over your shoulder at whatever shows up in the browsing screen. Um, but I just wanted to be upfront about the sources that I've plagiarized because I think it's important for people to be honest with each other if you really want to be remembered. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, we've spent a lot of time on this presentation already. <coughs> um, and, you know, we went through, um, uh, we did the effect of conflict on human brain. And um, I wanted, I put on a slide here of military deaths in World War I, only among the Entente powers. Um, now, those Entente powers are France, the British Empire, which back in World War I in the 19, in our early 1900s was, of course, still an empire, not a vestigial remnant of a great worldwide spanning civilization. Uh, we have Italy, Serbia, Romania, the United States, others, and of course, the Russian Empire. Um, and I think that this just wraps up my presentation succinctly to say the least, 
that the countries which died most have died most in the memory sense too. Because like I said earlier on, if you can't remember someone who died, then they're deader than someone you remember. Um, oh, yes. Wait. Something's wrong. I can feel it. Oh, okay. Act two. Here we are. Where did it happen? And how about when? Now, these are very two important questions that... I feel like I've been here before. Um... Um, excuse me, just a second, I need to get a drink of water. I seem to have lost my place. This would have been easier if I had the foresight to just simply number my slides, but that's okay. Act 2, where did it happen? Does the main character go into outer space? They do. How about when? Main character's going after outer space. Now, of course, when outer space invades Earth and it tries to become and take over inner space, we have to take the fight to outer space. Um, and I don't, I don't exactly remember how we got on the topic of my screenplay. Um, I hadn't intended to bring, bring this forward. I think I have, I have another slide, I believe. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. This is, yes. Um, <coughs> now we have several main characters, um, and we wanted this to be semi-autobiographical. So because the four people who fought in that secret space operation during World War I were, um, you know, the four Michaels, which we have the, um, the land site dedicated to them in eastern Jersey. Um, <coughs> now we got Michael, 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 and Michael. They're all actors, and they're all going to be playing Michael. Um, now those characters, of course, we had to dramatize it a little bit. Um, and I think I took, I, I think I took the story from a novel I read, I think so hard. I don't know. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. I think, okay. In conclusion, um, you know, memory, is just, it's just a big old, big old mess of things. Um, it's like when you have a, a plate full of water with red food coloring in it and you drop some oil on top and it does the wispy thing where it kind of tendrils down, you have the main thought and then all your memories kind of filter down. Uh, I got to call my dealer about that stuff he gave me last night. Cause it did something to me. Um, I, I apologize for the disjointed nature of this presentation. Um, I thought I had concluded this already. Um, but there's more. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, just a second. Okay. It's getting hot. Sorry. Um, oh, oh, God. Oh, God. I don't... Uh, okay. The thruple. I'm just going to put the scarf back on. The thruple. It's important to memory because you encode it and then you store it and then you retrieve it. But along the way, because it's an inherently, you know, they say the triangle is the most stable shape for building things but when it comes to building relationships between your memories you know one of those memories thinks it's like a great idea and they're super into it and the other memory is like well i don't want to lose that other memory so i'm going to go along with it they bring in the third memory and the first memory and the third memory get along really really well and the second memory starts to feel like you know i feel like you're encoding stuff and you're retrieving stuff without storing stuff properly and i just feel really left out and i know that this was a whole thing and um, this has been, I think there's another, let's go to the next slide. Um, because this has been dredging up a lot of uncomfortable <coughs> memories for me. Um, now in, conc in conclusion, um, you really have to charm the discordant voices in your head into some sort of democracy so that your brain can properly store memories in an order, which makes chronological sense. I don't remember putting this putting the slide on here. Um, I think I think that concludes my my thing. Please review this. Um, I want you to stare at the star. I want you to stare at the star, and that is the star that you will review this with. Now, those stars are, of course, Michael, 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 and Michael. Um, and I really hope that you would consider my screenplay, The Four Michaels of World War One, for your 
blacklist uh, contest survey. Uh, what's your name? Who are? Uh, yeah, the first one who raised the one with the beard and the the sh bandana. Uh, yeah, you uh talked about the four Michaels who, uh, as we saw, were uh, Michael Jordan, uh, Michael J. Fox, Michael Colby, and Michael Rooker. Um, yes. they notoriously don't get along with each other. I was just wondering how you got them in a room together and working with each other. Uh, the we green screened and then composited them into each other's shots. Um, we did have to cut the budget from the majority of the rest of the movie. Um, so the space scenes were shot against in my garage with um, we had hung black garbage bags on the walls mm -hmm. and then shined a flashlight on them to make it look like there were stars. And it, it actually looks very good. But we had to composite them into each other's shots throughout the entirety of the movie because it is, of course, a single location in one room facing the same wall. And all four of them are on frame for the entirety of the three hour runtime. It's a it's a real feat of movie making magic. Thank you, thank you. Of course, um, let's hear from Mick Manhattan. Well, I, I would like to stay on the Four Michaels for a second, and I'm wondering uh, now, with the Four Michaels of World War One, is uh, would they be interchangeable? Like, could you do the Four Chrises of World War One, or is that oh. too white bread? Well, for that question, I'm actually going to allow my my associate has returned um, now. Mr. Broomfield is going to answer your question for you. Oh, oh, oh I, I hear you. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate yeah. you. <laughs> Done? Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. I hope that answers your question. Well, I do have one more question. Of if course. It's okay. I don't mean to step on anyone. No. But I just, you know, I want to ask out of the four Michaels that we have here, which one cures cancer? By Conalingus. Mm. Uh, it is Michael Douglas. Um, ah, okay. Right. We did work in some autobiographical um, elements from all four of these actors' stories. Um, so I, I, I don't want to give too much away, but it's a very powerful scene. Okay. I, I can't wait to see it. Uh, and Thank let's you. hear, of course, uh, sweatshirt with words. Uh, thank you so much uh, from coming all the way from the film set to be here to talk about memory um i do like the way you put this into a three act structure i thought that was pretty interesting now if we could just stay on this four michael slide for a second uh now i know that you wanted <clears throat> excuse me i know you were planning on doing this entire movie with the first michael and then due to death after uh terrible things with children uh you had to switch and then turn it into a imaginarium of dr panassa style mm -hmm. where you had each of these actors playing the exact same character um, what was it about Michael Douglas that thought this was the way to go? Uh, well, he's playing in the later, later in life segment, mm. um, where of course, uh, you become a raging narcissistic asshole and mm. are impossible to work with. Excellent. And That's... we, as, as I said earlier, we tried to work in as many autobiographical parts of that as possible. Mm -hmm. So. And then you decided to bring Spawn in at the end. Why? Uh, because Spawn's badass. Damn right. Um, and I think I have a question on screen from Michael, the actor. He's. I. I wonder if he has me on mute. Oh. We don't have any microphones oh. in the audience. Well, oh, sorry. okay. He, he's okay. just going to have to stand there. Um, I guess. This is the Blacklist Indie Screenplay Awards, right? Absolutely. Okay. I would, yes. Thank you for memory. That's not what the movie's called. <laughs> all right. And now with all the presentations given, each member of the panel will indicate which speaker they believe deserves to win the $50,000 grant and the nostalgia prize from some nobody's Patreon account. Um, now, when we do the voting, as everyone knows, um, we are going to hold up the the coinciding finger with the number of the speaker who uh, went in that order. 
I'm sorry, my memory is shot. Um, so I am one, McManhattan is two, sweatshirt with words is three, and cat hair guru is four. Mm-hmm. So um, please choose the presentation that you thought was the most informative, and we will vote in three, two, one. <laughs> Don't... Oh, I forgot. Well, I'm sorry. I... <laughs> I don't want to be the guy who votes for himself, but if you're talking nostalgia, what's more nostalgic than Bill Cosby? <laughs> Nobody said nostalgia had to be good. You just had to remember it. <laughs> and no one That's will true. ever forget. So congratulations <laughs> to Mick Manhattan for winning the huge you, scholarship to know to know somebody's university. Um, Close enough. And, I know somebody's. and the nostalgia prize. <laughs> <laughs> so that concludes our conference this week. Uh, so please, Mick, since you are the winner, you get to tell us what next week's conference is going to be about. Wow, I was unprepared for this. <laughs> That's the point of the show, Mick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, the next week's conference should be about concussions. How good are they for man? <laughs> I think we did um, that one. The goodness of no, you don't. That's that was a different show, Dylan. Oh, okay. That was a show we did on football. Oh, right. Which oh, this is snap. concussions all around. Yeah. All right. So stay tuned next week for our conference on concussions and how they benefit mankind. I have been your host, Zach Wiseman, and my payment for doing this is to make someone uh, I can't read you... because that's something. Yeah, something's. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, thanks to each of our panelists, uh, uh, and I'm going to ask you all where we can find you outside of this (laughs) crazy show. How do you Um, never sound like a human? I don't. (laughs) How do you do that? How are you so funny and you do not know how to sound like a human being? I, I, (laughs) once, once you give me words to read, I... Lose stop my reading absolute them. mind. Just, just stop reading them. Talk to McMahon. McManhattan, yes. where can we find you? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I am one of the hosts of the Scene Snobs podcast. Uh, we also run the Scene Snobs channel. Please head over and check it out. We try to have a lot of fun, and hopefully, you guys will too. I, yeah. We agree. Uh, thank you. The Scene Snobs is a great podcast and a great <laughs> YouTube channel, probably. <laughs> Uh, Zach, Zach, reading. <laughs> Zach, <laughs> oh, yeah. where can we find you, my Let man? Let me just pull up this doc real fast. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mitch, <laughs> Mitch Philadelphia, and you can find me at Jack Billings Presents, me and my neighbor Michael, as well as Haunted Apartment Complex. Uh, no, you can find me uh, reading everything that Dylan writes over at somenobodies.com. You would literally open up your smart fridge, your smart toaster, an old pager, type in some nobodies, and you'll see some weird shit that we did. And I would love it if you looked at that. Please. They finally put all our stuff on the Sears Podcast Network. You know how many emails I've had to write Sears Scratch and Dent to make sure we can get on the old stoves? Yeah. A You'd lot. be surprised. Sears, everybody thinks since their stores went out of business uh, <laughs> that they're just gone. But but Sears mm. really runs a good podcast service. Yeah. yeah. They definitely only respond to emails. But yes, <laughs> I like that they capitalize the E. So it's Sears. Yes. They're, and they, they have no social media presence. You have to email Sears at Sears.Sears. Sears. Well, it's all um, paper based. <laughs> you have to send them a postcard. <laughs> All right, Dylan, where can people find you? Well, find me wherever you find Zach. <laughs> and on Twitter at Vorpal underscore words. We do the same things. Yeah, um, hang, out, hang out at Walmart's in Boulder, yeah. Colorado. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> if there were any in this town. Oh, yeah, go Incredible. stalk the aisles of the local Walmart. You might yeah. find us. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, Mitchell, Philadelphia, where can people find you? Once once you're done looking for Zach and Dylan in in Walmart's in Boulder, Colorado, uh, you can go over to Instagram.com backslash Jack Billings Presents, uh, where we finally started a, a, an Instagram <laughs> a week ago. And we... <laughs> 
and we have clips of our shows and stuff. So uh, everything, everything that we do is on the Instagram channel now. So the Instagram channel. I have no fucking idea what I'm saying. I'm you can, find, you can find the Instagram channel on every Roku and Apple Smart yes. TV. Uh, <laughs> Dylan, will you please tell us what our what our slogan of the week is? Uh, PowerPoint. And for about three months, it was just constant agony, and everyone was screaming all the time. You may remember those three months in 2002 where everyone... <clears throat> Thank you for watching PowerPoint Showdown. Today's winner will receive a $50,000 grant courtesy of some nobody's Patreon. Congratulations on your win! Join us next week for another showdown. Thanks for providing that big, 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 big prize, guys.